hello, 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 everybody. Uh, my name is John C. Liz, and uh, I'd like to do this uh, remembrance of uh, Genesis P. Orridge, who was a friend of mine, and uh, he belonged to uh, the old school noise industrial bands, Bob and Gristle, and eventually Psychic TV. Uh, before I go into uh, my memories of Genesis, which I'm sure some of you will find uh, entertaining or at least funny, uh, I would like to thank Frank from um, Vinyl On Demand Records in Germany for being a great supporter of both Sleep Chamber and uh, Psychic TV, along with Genesis, other projects, Robin Gristle, and etc. I would like to thank uh, Fred Gianelli, who is a one-time member of, of uh, Psychic TV, a friend of mine, and uh, we communicate on a semi-basis, you know, <laughs> once in a while. Um, and um, great supporter, Genesis Noor Wannabe, uh, great supporter of Genesis in full, and uh, I'd like to thank uh, Thomas Crooner, who's also a good uh, supporter of more, more or less Sleep Chamber, but uh, he's in the category there somewhere, okay? Um, I've got a couple of notes here because uh, um, they don't tell you everything, but they, they give me uh, a, a trigger to remember the memories, and some of these memories were great, all right? Uh, as, uh, as far as the people involved, and uh, I'm quite surprised that there hasn't been anyone else that would um, do something like this to remember someone who started the whole industrial culture, all right? Genesis uh, has a lot of similarities to me, I've noticed. I mean, he's prolific in what he does. He, um, he started the industrial culture by releasing um, industrial records, you know, a series of cassettes of mostly Throbbing Gristle uh, concerts and outtakes, and uh, along with uh, Richard Kirk and Cabaret Voltaire. You know, um, he really stuck out as being somebody with an agenda that could and did accomplish something. Now, are you groups and bands to this day that claim that you're a noise band or you're into industrial, then uh, you got to realize where your roots are. And your roots come from somebody who was uh, genuine in the agenda of being, um, you know, uh, taking, say, uh, the politics of music and uh, fashion it, fashioning it around your own agenda. Now, uh, as far as I knew Gen Genesis, he had his own agenda and it was very powerful. It was very um, uh, genuine. So I know I keep saying, <laughs> saying that word, but, uh, you know, um, be before Genesis, we... PRH and Psychic TV and Throbbing Gristle, we had uh, music like uh, Stockhausen, all right, which was an experimental, um, uh, what do you call it, music? Um, uh, well, and John Cage, another experimental pioneer. Now, those bands or those uh, musicians or composers of... Um, classical music, that's what I was looking for, uh, had no agenda. They were just experimenting with music. You know, uh, Symphony of Sledgehammers or uh, a lot of the stuff Cage did with an alarm clock ticking and the audience waiting for him to perform. I mean, some of you older people know uh, the experimentation of the avant-garde that was happening in the 60s, all right? In the 70s, you know, we, uh, Genesis, uh, I don't, I gotta be honest with you, I, I am not of, of enough of a fan that I know about where it started other than Throbbing Gristle, okay? 
I mean, that's where I picked up on it. And, you know, that's, that's kind of where, you know, basically in Cabaret Voltaire is where my music started to shift into more of an avant-garde uh, style. Um, you know, it's known as music concrete, or it was known, until Genesis basically changed it to industrial music. All right? And a lot of you musicians now starting out with your new bands, your new concepts, uh, call it noise. It all generated from these roots. Um, let's see. We'll start off with the first memory. All right? Okay, what do we got? Mass College of Art, of course. All right, because this is, uh, well... This is important, and you know, I hope somebody will do this for me someday when I'm not here. But in all um, sympathy, my best wishes to the Genesis BRH clan, his family members, everybody. I mean, um, I was a true friend to him and vice versa. And we started out with um, Mass College of Art, okay? Uh, I used to run a record store. And I specialized in industrial music and uh, cassettes. This was in the 80s. And this is when people used to release their uh, music independently on cassette. Because with cassette machines, you could do your own stuff, make your own covers, blah, blah, blah. Well, Genesis pretty much was ahead of the league with Throbbing Gristle. Okay? Uh, not only was out performing in art galleries and etc. He was putting out product. And he tagged the name Industrial. Now, to this day, that name Industrial Music is a very, very uh, heavy, or it's the front, mo it's a type of music, actually. It's considered a type of music, Industrial. Now, that, that has all different kinds of meanings, which I really don't want to go into. I want to stick with Genesis, okay? Okay, these two people were running um, Mass College of Art. And I had a record store, and I did promotions on um, WZBC in Boston, Boston College Radio. And I would give them records, and they would give me, um, you know, uh, this record was promoted or uh, given by, you know, Inner Sleeve Records. And people would come to the store. Okay, so San Chappelle, I believe her name was, in this uh, dink called Keith, had come to my store and they were requesting Sleep Chamber play Mass College of Art. Now, this was in 1983 or 84. Um, I suggested to them that they should try to get uh, Psychic TV. Psychic TV had just sort of evolved from Thorb and Gristle at that point. And uh, I know they were on Virgin Records and uh, etc. But um, I thought it would be a good show to do Thorb and Gristle, not Thorb and uh, Psychic TV. And uh, not too often we would be, well, in the early days, an opener, all right? Uh, our music was somewhat similar. As much as these assholes want to say we're a uh, psychic TV imitation band, you know, it just shows their ignorance and uh, just basically what they don't know, all right? They're not, they're not anybody who knows anything about music, I'll tell you that, because they would study both sides and see where... Pretty much different. A lot of similarities. I mean, other than both of us being English and both of us being uh, into being uh, the individual and pushing individuality uh, as a very important thing for society to stay in charge and to be who you're supposed to be. Okay? These two people came to my store and, and uh, told me later on, uh, we got... Psychic TV, I gave them the address and everything. Uh, they said, we got Psychic TV to play. You know, Mass College of Art, they're very happy about that. But um, they left us off the bill because I guess it was costing too much to fly them over. Now, a couple days went by and I guess they had arrived. And Jen and John Gosling were staying at uh, 23 Stilling Street. Uh, Mass College of Art, uh, you know, dorm or whatever you want to, not dorm, uh, a, um, you know, those big art spaces, what do they call them? I'll think in a minute. Um, what the hell is it called? A loft. They had gigantic lofts. So, um, 
they came again to the store, and this is where it gets fun. Uh, there was another guy in the band who had just sort of um, became part, part of the sleep chamber. His name was Malcolm Smith. His original concept, which a lot of people you know, is called Document or Document Project. And I thought they had a lot of uh, interesting talent. So I, re you know, re-released some of their music and worked with them. Uh, I played shows. This is a wicked uncomfortable chair. That's why I'm fidgeting. Um, I did some shows with them, blah, blah, blah. Malcolm eventually joined Sleep Chamber, but he had a throbbing gristle obsession, all right? Uh, like no other. I'm sure there's other people who are just obsessed with throbbing gristle, but... Uh, I knew it was going to be a uh, situation when he met Genesis because this is this is this is Malcolm meeting his superhero, and Malcolm has a certain kind of character and personality which is just uh, primed for this kind of thing. And uh, they came into the store, right? Well, somebody came into the store, right? And we were talking, we were waiting. Genesis is going to show up. Oh, uh, psychic TV, you know, the whole throbbing gristle. Malcolm was just totally out of his mind, all right? And uh, what happened was, uh, I guess a, a midget, a small person, walked into the store. And we were busy talking, and I said to him, I goes, uh, Genesis is here. And he's like, what? And I goes, yeah, he's over there. And we could hear a person walking around the uh, aisles of the store, but we couldn't see him because he was too short. I said, oh yeah, man, he's, he's wicked fucking short. And I mean, Malcolm obviously, you know, Malcolm was, uh, he had a type of ego where he would believe anything if you were convincing enough. So um, I was like, yeah, he's over there. And this guy had a short haircut, a whiffle, or crew cut, whatever you want to call it, a bald head. And uh, I was laughing so hard I couldn't even talk because Malcolm was assuming this midget was Genesis. But then the door, ran, you know, the bells rang on the door and um, Genesis came in with, along with San Chappelle and um, this Keith imbecile. And uh, I think that was it. Uh, they came in the store. Uh, we were introduced, pleasantries exchanged. And um, I had a big cat, I had a big tabby cat, and uh, he used to sit on the edge of the counter, and he was a super alpha male. And Genesis went by <laughs> and petted him, and uh, my cat bit him. And, you know, what kind of situation, what, what are you going to say? Uh, I was like, geez, Jen, I'm sorry. He's like, I don't like cats very much, don't like them at all. I'm a dog person myself, so... That, that went on and that passed by. And uh, Jen had said to me, you know, um, you guys are pretty cool. I like you guys. Uh, uh, do you want to come over to 23 Sterling Street? You know, one of the lofts. Because um, I guess the other art students weren't so crazy about Psychic TV. I mean, I think it was a little too subversive for them. So I said, yeah, sure. And uh, I went over by myself, and um, I brought a girl with me, uh, Rochelle, Rochelle Royer. We went over there, and uh, we talked with Jen and John Gosling, and we talked about the tape deconstruction concert they were going to do at Mass College of This was in 1984. And, uh, you know, just basically musician to musician, or individual to individual, individual. We, we hit it off pretty quick, really quick. And um, I guess they were filming them getting their head shaved because they were already shaved, but they were doing a touch up for the, uh, the performance. And at that time, Jen was uh, wearing the shaved head with the ponytail Tibetan monk uh, type of uh, haircut. And uh, they were cutting their hair, and I guess people in there were just uh, nervous of them, didn't like them, whatever. And there was some confrontation going on. Uh, I'm not sure of the details, but uh, I know that, uh, like Jen, there are certain people that don't take 
shit from um, uh, people who think they're big shots or whatever you want to call it. See, I, I'm, I am really trying to make this nice. But uh, I remember <clears throat> we ran around and Jen spray painted a few times, Love and Piss, PTV. You know, which is, uh, you know, uh, a sexual um, category or, or notion that both of, both of us were basically into was, you know, I mean, him more than me at that time. I mean, I was a little bit more softer, I think, with my stuff. I was more into eroticism where he was into, you know, uh, pornography and uh, things like that. Okay, but uh, let's see, where are we? Uh, we met them, um, document, uh, okay, store, ethic one, okay. Mm, yeah, we can talk about Toby. Yeah, when uh, we got together, uh, we talked a lot about um, Sleep Chamber and Psychic TV, and Jen actually asked me if um, I was trying to crop copy the Psychic TV cross. And uh, I wasn't offended, but I was like, what do you mean by that? And he goes, well, if you take the double E's in sleep chamber and you rever and you kind of put them uh, in a negative state, they almost, I said, yeah, well, I'm not trying to copy a TV antenna, believe me. The E's in sleep chamber reversed stand for the infinity loop, which in um, Sanskrit, those letters with some sort of wing on them stand for forever and eternity. And that's what it means in sleep, in sleep chamber when they're reversed, simple. So, I mean, we got along, he got it, and we had a great time, I mean, hanging out. We would go to, uh, I mentioned the haircuts. Uh, that's kind of when I joined uh, Topi. He asked me to do join the Temple of Psychic Youth, and I have my patch, uh, my ID. Um, I, he gave me some... Um, necklaces with the cross and you know he would send stuff and we uh you know i gotta keep this in category because there's so much of it not so much of it but just it's just complicated all right all right that's done uh jenna's young oh we discussed the tape deconstruction he was going to do him and john gosling at the uh, mass college of art um theater and um, he didn't go into like the kind of detail, and I don't blame him because I wouldn't either. I mean, you really don't discuss, even with another band member, your concept of what you're going to do that night. But they did a uh, performance called Tape Deconstruction, which they were playing five to six uh, cassette decks at once, and they were mixing them on stage. There really wasn't a performance. Uh, Genesis went over to the piano and, you know, played a couple of uh, riffs on the piano and uh, that was it. But they were also showing films of um, early Throbbing Gristle videos um, of, um, is it Chris Christopherson being, um, you know, where they, they cut open his uh, balls and take out one of his ball sacks or something. And it was pretty brutal. And on the other, this was on the big major screen. I mean, this was a big, say, 30 by 20 screen. It was gigantic. Then on the sides, they had monitors, all provided by Mass College of Art. And uh, on those, they had other videos going, which were Jim Jones and all kinds of other subversive material to make people feel uncomfortable. Um, on top of that, you know, they were using the sub-bass frequency very uh, heavily. You know, they really sunk that sub-bass down where people were feeling the vibrations of the bass into their bodies. Now, Genesis, as, a, uh, as, uh, as far as psychology is concerned, this is where we uh, both sort of um, agreed or, like, we had so much in similar and, and similar. we had so much in similar <laughs> we had so much you know uh, things that were similar um, we put or he put video cameras up in the balcony 
and we film the audience. Now, one thing about psychology that he brought out, this was all his concept, this was Jen's concept. He brought out the point of studying humans and uh, how uh, instinctive behavior works. And it was interesting because I was just about, you know, between magic and psychology and philosophy and those kind of things wrapped up into a, you know, um, a bag. We watched the videos after the show. I mean, people were leaving the show because it was too intense. I mean, it was very, very specialized and very much a sensory overload. Now, I asked him why didn't you film you guys yourselves on stage? And he said, why? We weren't doing anything but mixing tapes. So at first, uh, I didn't understand. But then when we started the talk, he said, watch when people enter, because the cameras were rolling uh, maybe an hour before the show or half an hour before the show. He uh, said to me, he said, watch when people come into the theater, how many people go to the right and how many people go to the left. And most people will go to the right just because they're right-handed, all right? That, that's simple psychology. But it was an interesting concept to bring forward in, uh, you know, a musical performance. And uh, it also filmed, uh, you know, we kind of sped it up and watched how people were twitching and people were leaving. And uh, it's, uh, I, I think it was one of the, it was one of the best sensory overload shows uh, I have ever experienced to this day. I mean, I've seen a lot of noise bands. Uh, I asked no noise bands asked me to be on my label, all this stuff. But the thing is, they have no character. You've got to have some sort of character or concept when you're, you know, you're doing something like this. And most noise bands just want to make noise because it's subversive, or it gets attention, or like, or to these days, likes and fucking views. But you know what? This was coming from an originator who invented, invented industrial music. He had a cassette label called Industrial Records. Okay? Well, um, where are we now? <laughs> okay. Tape reconstruction, since you're looking up. Uh huh. Oh. While, while we were waiting, uh, you know, I guess he had a show to do in Chicago right after Boston. And um, Mass College of Art had booked Diamanda Gallus, which if you don't know who she is, look her up. But I'm sure most of you people who are watching this know who she is. Uh, she's a screamer. She's a woman who does all this uh, vocal manipulation with effects and whatever. She, it's interesting, okay, if that's your thing. But um, San Chappelle, you know, the one who was in charge of all this, introduced us to uh, Diamante Gallus. And, uh, you know, we went out and hung around with her for a day or two. And um, it was funny. And I'm not putting her down. I'm not, um, I'm not doing anything like that. But this is really what happened. When she got with us and she knew who Genesis was, she knew who I was, and she was just trying to bake, break the market as the Amanda Gallus in the industrial vocal scene. So she wanted to hang out. She was a girl, two guys. Oh, plus uh, I had a girl friend of mine, um, uh, Rochelle Royer, who I uh, kind of hooked up Jen with just to be, not a babysitter, but just somebody to, you know, keep them happy and show show them Boston and stuff. So the four of us went out and we, we were hanging out. And at one point, Diamanda says, hey, guys, you want to get high? Now, Jen isn't really, as far as I know, any kind of drug user, all right? But I am. So I said to her, I go, so what do you, what do you have? And uh, she claims she's got Prozac. Now, Prozac is like a, a fluoride type of sedative that's made from like rat poison. It's basically to, um, if you read up on fluoride or chlorine, uh, or the fluoride sulfate, it's basically something that dumbs you down, makes you slower so you can't be aggressive. 
So we passed on that. And uh, after the second day, it was getting a little tedious because uh, I think the Amani comes from California. I'm not sure. But um, we didn't all really kind of fuse together. Diamanda was kind of like the uh, odd man out, like they say. And she would say to Genesis, Jen, you know, I did this, that, and the other thing. You know what I mean, Jen? And he'd say, yeah, the, yes, Diamanda, I know what you mean. But Diamanda had a habit of saying this almost after every sentence she would say, do you know what I mean? Oh, it's not with an English accent. Do you know what I mean, Genesis? And Jen would look at me and smile and say, Yes, damn mind, I know what you mean. And this went on for like the whole day. But at the end of the day, when she used it, she said, Jen, you know, we should do this, that, and the other thing, or do a tour together. Um, she said, Jen, do you know what I mean? And at this point, Jen kept, you know, he kept saying to me, what, what is with this? What is with this? I mean, and I say, just, 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 you know, I'll go on with whatever. And, uh, Jen, do you think we should all do a tour and this and that? It would be great. Uh, do you know what I mean, Jen? And the first time Jen said, no, Diamanda, I don't know what you mean. She's kind of lost for words, but that became the joke. It was like, do you know what I mean, Jen? No, I don't know, Diamanda, I don't know what you mean. And she was a loss, and uh, it, it wasn't a mean thing, but it was just kind of a funny thing. So we got to do that. Uh, the girl that I, I um, right, Rochelle, I had her hang out with Jen when I wasn't there. I mean, we drove around in my car, and um, I had the kind of seats that you fall forward. And, and at this point, Genesis is such a small, skinny guy, he could fit in my back seat without pushing the seat up, which was... <laughs> I don't think I knew anybody that could do that. But, you know, we went out shopping to buy stuff. We had stuff, cool stuff. We uh, we had lunch and dinner. Uh, we went to the recording studio for a couple of days and recorded all this stuff, which came out to be nothing, you know, uh, basically because we had no arrangements. But we, we all went in there and jammed or whatever. Uh, Malcolm Smith came back into the picture at this point who is, uh, was an official member of Sleep Chamber, but unfortunately a throbbing gristle fanatic. So um, we went from the studio over to Malcolm Smith's house and uh, we were supposed to do an interview for the magazine, The Other Sound. Okay, if you remember that magazine or that fanzine I was putting out in the, uh, I think it was the 80s, uh, we had done, I think we did an interview with Cozy, and uh, we did things with Steve Stapleton, and yeah, it was just an industrial fanzine, that's all. Not, nothing fancy, but um, we, we wanted to do an interview with Genesis, and uh, we set up the recorders and everything, and uh, Malcolm was so obsessed with Genesis, uh, we really didn't get to ask him any questions. It was basically, if you know what I mean, a... Um, it was just conversations. I mean, he spent more time, him and Jim spent more time, uh, it was mostly Malcolm, uh, making fun of this band White House and uh, other industrial bands trying to copy uh, the Throbbing Gristle Record uh, first annual report. All right, so, I mean, there was a lot of that joking around. Uh, I know second annual report, but I'm not familiar how the tie-in with White House is, because I really don't know White House or familiar with the material. I just heard their really uh, severe noise, feedback, whatever. Okay. Uh, so the interview was a, um, was nothing. They never, we could never do nothing with it, but I did put an issue out on Psychic, Psychic TV, which I'm sure a lot of you people know where I put them on the cover and there were pictures of him and stuff. Matter of fact, uh, I have a whole roll, a two, no, one roll of uh, film where I, uh, I took pictures of him and John Gosling at this press conference. And I took a lot of personal pictures at the um, Mass College of Art um, loft. 
And uh, I think you've seen that where he's pretending he's on the cross. I gotta get those developed if I can get to that shit. Uh, you know, we drank wine, but uh, it's Okay. All right. Um, then they had a Chicago, they had a uh, performance to do in Chicago PTV. It was John Gosling in Genesis. All right. They did an interview and a press conference here. Then they they went to Chicago to do a show. And uh, when he got back, um, he was asking me for the tape to the tape deconstruction that they had done at Mass Call Javad. And uh, I said, I was no part of that. And he said, well, ask Stan or Keith. I said, yeah, no problem. So um, they went back to England, okay? They went back home. And uh, uh, I got another memory, but that's gonna have to wait. They went back home and uh, my job or my, uh, was suggested to me was to get the master soundboard tape of tape deconstruction. It was recorded on um, 24 tracks. Right. No, not <laughs> I'm really getting lost here. It was recorded on eight tracks. All right, it was an eight track uh, cassette recorder, but they had eight individual inputs. So you can really do a lot when you have that many single tracks as far as, uh, you know, releasing some. Um, well, she, uh, the girl from Mass called Javad seemed to be avoiding me, so I went down to the loft by myself, and uh, we had wine and talked, and she actually was playing the tape in another room of the tape deconstruction. I mean, I didn't recognize her, but then she told me, and then I could sort of figure it out. But uh, she wasn't interested in handing it over to Genesis. Now you gotta realize something as an artist. I mean, all of this is your hard work. This is your performance. This is historical documentation, all of that kind of stuff. And it's all got to do with your um, efforts in what you're doing. You know, it's your creative artistic property. She avoided me I, and I was writing back to Jen saying, you know, look, um, she doesn't want to pass it up. She doesn't want to hand it up. And she, and he said, go and say your official Topi members. That's, you know, when he sent the card and all the stuff, I said, okay, no problem. Uh, I had gone down there with Malcolm, which by this point, <laughs> we both had psychic TV haircuts. I mean, uh, the influence had rubbed off on us where we admired the haircuts. I mean, we were just long-haired uh, industrial guys. We weren't anything special. And we admired the, the PTV Tibetan haircut. So we had both gotten the haircuts uh, and we showed up at Mass College of Art looking for the tape. And of course, you know, it was like not home, refusal, all this stuff. And at one point I had cornered uh, in Mass College of Art, Keith, and I said to him, I goes, you could turn over that soundboard tape to me right now. He said, oh, we're releasing it. We're releasing it as a uh, C90 cassette. Cassettes were big in those days. And I said, well, you don't have the rights. And he goes, oh, we have the rights because it was on our property. I said, so don't play that, that game because you'll lose. Um, he, he even went into the point of saying it's going to be a blue leather cover. It's going to have a cassette in it. It's going to have the, um, I don't know, the little um, sheet that they tell you what's going to go on in the show. I don't know what it's called. And it was going to have a gold cross on it. And I said, that's all well and fine, but it's not yours. So at that point, it was inevitable there was going to be friction. And not to mention, these imbeciles couldn't release a cassette if their life depended on it. They're, one, they're these people who talk about doing things but never do. You know the type? Oh, I'm going to do this and that. Now they've got a real piece of history or a piece of something they can sell. And these imbeciles could not get together to even release it. So in return, me and Jen agreed to release that um, WZBC interview 
when uh, Jen and John went up to uh, WZBC with Sandy Sharon and played the um, the cackling of Jim Jones and sort of promoted the stuff and whatever. And um, I even talked to the DJ Sin, uh, Sandy Sharon. And she was like, those guys are crazy. They're sick. They're insane. I said, oh, yeah. So we released that cassette. It was only like a 45 minute interview cassette. And it came with a booklet. I mean, I th I'm sure some of you own it. And the interview well, it was a press conference that uh, John Small basically, uh, you know, he took his ca cassette recorder and uh, basically typed out the whole thing, which was a lot of work. But that was released. And funny, I sent Jen. A um, hundred of them, and uh, Malcolm got one in the mail. <laughs> now I don't know why Malcolm got one in the mail if he was a uh, PT. Well, I guess they sent them all out to uh, Topi members, all right. And uh, one of the last details I forgot to mention was um, uh, these are English guys that you know we haven't really had. You know we don't know too much about them, but we uh, Jen was spending time with Rochelle. You know, hanging out, doing whatever. Rochelle even carved in a psychic cross into the middle of her forehead like uh, Charles Manson. So it was perfect. It was like, yeah, you'll get along good with her. Um, we went out with Josh, John Gosling one night. And um, this is when, you know, I really was tripping the light fantastic. I knew a lot of people, a lot of places, you know, could get into the clubs and whatever. So... Uh, we ended up at a party, and uh, we offered John Gosling some cocaine, which he was, uh, oh, oh, no, 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 no. I guess, I don't know if he had a problem before, or he never did it, but he was very disturbed that we would even offer him, you know, cocaine. You know, and I eventually found out that, dro that Jen, Genesis, really doesn't do drugs, or didn't do drugs at that point. He was just, uh, you know, we drank wine, bottles of red wine. And uh, that was about it, you know? He wasn't a cigarette smoker or any of that kind of stuff or pot. It was just uh, red wine. And uh, he was a vegetarian and uh, all that nice stuff. But uh, we discussed a lot of philosophies about individualiz individuality. Uh, we discussed Brian Jones at one point because um, this flare-up of, you know, him doing... Uh, God star and us, you know, coming out with the uh, sonorous invocations of Brian Jones, people were calling us a psychic TV wannabe band. But the truth is, I mean, uh, I, in the 70s, I had the global Rolling Stones fan club. I mean, um, I had over 100,000 Rolling Stones records and uh, predominantly anything I could get with Brian Jones on it. I mean, I admired his music. I admired the way he could put a sitar into something or a monica. I mean, he was just a musician, like they say, that could play anything. And that was my admiration of him. And uh, he was the leader of the Rolling Stones. I mean, uh, I even had material by Brian Jones of his uh, the soundtrack he did for A Degree of Murder. So me and Jen talked about Brian Jones. I guess he met Brian uh, backstage at a Thank You Lucky Stars TV show in London on the BBC. So he had me trumped on that one. But uh, still, I mean, we just had the same things in common. It was coincidental. Nobody was copying anyone. Jeez, I mean, you know, the people that, that say that are the same people who are like, who put the one thumbs down? That person. That's the type of troll that goes around putting thumbs down to things saying that we're copying Psyche TV. Oh, all right, when he was home, he kept asking me about the soundboard tape and, uh, you know, I'm not the type of guy that goes away. I mean, we went there at night, went to the day, we tried to break in, we tried everything, but, you know, it was on like the fifth floor, so we really couldn't, uh, you know, get up there. But um, that kind of uh, was a downer, you know, it was like, these people don't deserve to have this, and yet they never did anything with it. And right now, who knows where it is? Mm. Oh, okay. Uh, when Jen returned back to England and uh, he got back into the temple, 
um, philosophies and whatever was going on with Topi. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I can't say. And, and, you know, he kept a regular um, writing letters um, basis with me. You know, he would always write me letters. And uh, I guess from coming from an art school, all his letters were always designed with cut out pictures and colorful things and subversive things and whatever. And he sent me pictures of a movie set or a movie crash or something they were doing at that time where a cog fell off a cliff or drove off a cliff and smashed down onto the beach and all the people were hanging out. That's all I know according to the pictures that he had sent me and what he had said, you know. But I'll tell you, every letter I got from him always was decorated in a very unique way. You know, I've got them somewhere. Um, and some of them somebody stole, but uh, he was uh, really cool on when it came down to writing letters. You always looked forward to it, you know. We said, well, is that okay, I told him, yes, I would not let me on it, okay. Yeah, that's done. All right, uh, I told him my administration. Oh, okay, here's another one. Um, at the time, uh, Jen had done, like I said, I'm not a big, uh, I'm an admirer, but I'm not a big listener to Psychic TV or Throbbing Gristle. I spend all my time doing my musical projects, so I have very little time to like really check out other um, bands or groups. And I hate it when interviewers ask you, Who's your main influence? Who's your favorite band? Because it doesn't work like that after a while. Once you become an established musician, you only listen to your own music and you own your own uh, product. I mean, the band, um, uh, when bands think there's some sort of solidarity between bands, there is not. Every band is in competition for themselves and that's just the way it works. And it's kind of acceptable, you know, if you're an established band, all right? And Sleep Chamber was, and so was in Psychic TV. Um, oh, I told him that I really admired uh, the track Sincerity. It's on Dave Ball's uh, solo album called In Strict Tempo. Uh, thank you, Thomas, for the copy of that. Um... I told him I really thought that was one of my favorite uh, songs by him, Sincerity. I really, I was like, Frank Sinatra, you know, that was great. It was fantastic. And I said, Dave Ball, you know, he does the music for Soft Cell, which uh, to this day, I mean, that, that, that beginning Soft Cell stuff, I really admired the production, uh, the 808 drum machine, and just the way Dave Ball had the edge or just, uh, I won't say sense of humor, but uh, I mean, he did a really unique album, all right? And Jen was on it. And Virgin Prunes, uh, I don't know, it was Gabby or who it was, sang a song on it. And I said, you know, right now, this is the album I'm listening to. And uh, I dig it. I think Dave Ball's awesome. And, uh, you know, and, and he's like, oh, you know, you like that? And I was like, yeah, yeah. And I said, if I was you, I would bring him in as a musician, maybe play keyboards or sequence or or even that big 808 kick, something. But Dave Ball, to me, is uh, was the main, you know, influence when it came to changing my sound. And uh, he wrote me back about, I don't know, a month or two later, telling me that Dave Ball was going to produce the new uh, Psychic TV album. And so I was like, wow, that's fucking fantastic. That's great. I can't wait. So uh, I was glad that, you know, they teamed up with him because, uh, you know, um, Soft Cell, Dave Ball, and the uh, Psychic TV album, all, all to do with Dave Ball were, were, were nice packages, nice music, presented right. You know what I mean? Uh, we don't have Nicky Hopkins playing piano in the background. We got real, you know, individuals here, not established musicians. Okay. Uh, both of us were busy at that time, you know, so it was harder for us to keep this, uh, to keep in touch with each other because, uh, anytime Jen was on tour, 
he would never write. And anytime I was, I was doing something, I couldn't write. I mean, we're both musicians pushing our own ideology. And, uh, you know, it just comes to that. You kind of fade apart. Uh, we were never in competition. Not at all. I mean, uh, me and Jen had a lot of fun times. And, uh, you know, when he was staying here, you know, we put him up, we drove him around, we did everything. We had a great time with him. It, it was fun. And that, that's how I remember Genesis, okay? I remember, I remember him from the 80s, because that's how the biggest exposure I had to him. And I can't believe that all these bands that are claiming they're noise bands or, or industrial bands, nobody has done such a thing as to say, you know what, you know, uh, uh, credits or kudos or whatever the word you want to use to Genesis PR or Psychic TV or, or Throb and Gristle. Nobody does it. Because, you know what, they don't even have the credibility to begin with that makes it matter. But I'm doing it now. Hopefully somebody will do it for me when I'm not here. Okay? Because the kind of work that both of us did takes up your whole life. It takes up all your um, attention and you become obsessed with it. But that is the only way you're going to succeed in what you're doing is to give your life to your agenda. Okay, and he did it, and to the day he dies, I, you know, I give him credibility for what he did. He stuck to it till his dying day. He was ready to go on tour, I heard, that week, and he ended up going to the hospital. So, I don't know the story. At this point, it doesn't matter. What I'm trying to portray here is Genesis Peorage as, you know, I knew him and the memories I had, and they were all good. We never had any bad ones. Uh, yeah, we already did that. You know, um, anybody who studies either one of the bands will notice, you know, we have our similarities, maybe because we're both English, maybe because it's a, a um, um, I don't know. You're asking me, I don't have the answers. All I know is, you know, I was doing Brian Jones stuff way before uh, I did Sleep Chamber. You know, I admired all his erotic, exotic styles, whether you're smoking hash or shaking marambas. And I think Jen had the same fetish for him. You know what I mean? Um, lastly, um, this I say because it is somewhat documented. And, you know, I get pissed at, you know, I think there's some guy in Canada that, you know, just re-released -re -re a store interview with Jen acting or titling it like it was something new of his death. And it really pissed me off that he, um, he's a real goofy guy. Um, he he kind of tried to portray it like he, he, you know, just to get the views, hits, or, or the popularity. But that's bullshit, man. We don't need that trash fucking um, journalism. You know what I mean? It's like, get on and put your own face on and tell, you, tell, tell everybody what it was like to meet him. Tell him what it was like to be his friend. Not just stick up the same friggin' interview in a store, which I guess Jen was holding up a, um, a bootleg CD called uh, Brian Come Back You Bastard, which this is really bizarre. I made that CD in the 70s when I was into the Rolling Stones. I made a uh, recording of, uh, they had a concert for Brian Jones in 69 at High Park, and I put the eulogy on one side and I think I put a song on the other. And it's all misspelt on the label, so you can tell it's me. But uh, it was called Brian Come Back, You Bastard. And uh, Jen said something like, oh, I wouldn't call it that or something. But that's something I seen. Uh, where did I get that title? Oh, I saw that on Jim Morrison's grave just before they removed it out of uh, Paris. But I thought it was an excellent title. You know, it basically means that you miss the guy. It doesn't mean anything. Stupid. All right. So, oh, you know this story. Uh, I don't like to tell, but I like to clarify it. Um, Jen, you know, Psychic TV played in Boston in I think it was 2012, and it was at the Paradise. And um, you know, we went to see it. There were like a couple of guys from Sleep Chamber, uh, and a couple of friends. 
And of course, uh, my friends were non-musicians and they brought psychic TV CDs, you know, deluxe ones, you know, uh, doubles, triples, whatever. And they wanted me to ask him to autograph them. Now, I guess this was um, shortly after his surgery. And um, I went there early and... Uh, <laughs> If you had a psychic ID card, right, basically you were told that you could go anywhere, all concerts are free, blah, 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 if you were a temple member. Now, that was in the 80s. We're talking 2012, so I don't think anybody even had a psychic TV ID card but me, and it was in, you know, my box of uh, memorabilia. So I pulled it out, and uh, we went to the paradise, about uh, five or six of us. And uh, we were doing mushrooms and drinking wine, and we went to a couple of bars. So we were pretty much, uh, you know, in the state for a concert. Um, what happened? Well, we went to the concert. Um, I was looking for Fred Gianelli. Hi, Fred. Yeah. And I guess you had left, and somebody in the crew had told me you and Jen had a fight or an argument about something. I said, wow, okay. So uh, the people in the club were asking me, uh, you know, you're going to pay to get in. You know, it hasn't opened yet. And I said, look, I'm an official member, blah, 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 blah. They looked at the ID and they didn't know what to make of it. So they're like, yeah, okay, go ahead. So I went in and I waited around about an hour and Jen showed up. And I think he was with Caress. Hi, Caress, if you're watching. Um, and... Uh, I had asked Jen, I said, look, I got a couple of, um, you know, dingo buddies here, and uh, can you autograph, you know, the CDs for them, that it, they would be really appreciated, plus it would make me look like a big shot. <laughs> but uh, he was in a bad mood, and he said, absolutely not, which threw me back. And he also said something to me, you know, in our conversation. I get a big hug, and where's Fred, and... There was something weird going on. I guess there, there was a fight in the band and he had to replace it, whatever. And um, he had said to me, he goes, um, wow, you really go old. I said, what do you mean? He goes, oh, you look terrible. You, you've you gotten so old. Now, the last time I seen him was in 1984. This is 2012. So what's that? Eight, four, nine, four, I don't know, 20 odd years. So I guess, you know, uh, I am going to get old. But uh, it almost got to a point where, you know, I let my ego get to a point where I was pissed off, you know, at a statement like that. Because face it, I mean, most musicians or or um, band members, leaders, whatever, are somewhat vain in their appearance or in their, uh, you know, what they look like. So to me, that was... That was a little pushy. He left and he was going back to uh, work on the sound check. And there was a girl there with him. And uh, I'm pretty sure she had witnessed the whole exchange. And I said to her, I goes, oh, looks like the queen mom is having a tough day today. And uh, she kind of giggled and she introduced herself. It was caress. It was his daughter. So, of course, I felt terrible about that. And I said, you know, and she said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, then the show began, and um, I guess we were really, you know, well, I was pissed off because of my uh, vanity. And the rest of the guys who was with will, you know, basically start trouble over the drop of a dime, those guys that I used to hang out with. But... Um, during the concert, you know, we were heckling and whatever, and they were forced to stop at points and put the spotlights on us and whatever. And uh, uh, we ended up leaving, you know, just right, right towards the end. And uh, I had written him a letter and saying, you know, it was kind of, you know, fucked up and whatever. And, you know, I don't want to go into personal letters back and forth, but, uh, you know, uh, it wasn't left as a bad thing. It was just looked at as, you know, 
something that happened, whatever. But I hope you enjoyed the stories or me just remembering my good times with Genesis Theorich because he was the innovator, man. He, he, he was the, um, he was the guy that started in the title industrial music, industrial records. And we should all give him that credibility. And the people who gave him shit, oh yeah, he told me another story just before we go. He had a belt on and when you under the buckle, there was a knife in it. And I said, uh, that's, that's nice, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, he's, and he was telling me, he goes, yeah, I was in London and I was in a pub and we were drinking and not drinking, but you know, having a good time. And um, he goes, I had to leave it inside someone. This is my second one. At first I thought it was sexual, he <laughs> left it inside someone, but it meant that he had stabbed someone. But, uh, and I just heard recently that there's, a, there's some kind of rash or shit or some shit heels, you know, um, giving him his name a, um, you know, subversive bullshit put down. And to me, if you want to do that, you know, Jen had his moods like we all do. He could be in a good mood and he could be an asshole, but most of the time he was a genuine guy and I liked him and he was my fucking friend. So any issues with him, I will pick up from now on. If you got shit with him, come see about me, okay? Because he was a friend of mine, all right? And uh, I hope you enjoyed this little um, remembrance of my friend, Genesis Fiorich. Thank you.